Guys, I've been going nuts with this one. This is the beginning of James Brown's I Got You. Whoa! I feel good. The question that's been bugging me with this one and the question that I have for you guys is where is the emphasis here? Is he singing I feel good? Is he singing I feel good? Is he singing I feel good? Whoa! I feel good. You could make the argument any number of different ways, none of which feel all that satisfying. The vocal performance seems to defy traditional understanding in linguistics and music theory of stress patterns. And so today we're gonna try and figure out the question that nobody asked, uh, what is the proper scansion for James Brown singing I feel good? I feel good. <laughs> this video is brought to you by CuriosityStream and my streaming service, Nebula. I said when I woke up this morning, I heard a disturbing sound. So, if you speak a language natively, you grow up intimately familiar with its rhythm, the natural push and pull of its internal cadence. What sounds need to happen when? That's why in English, the name of the show is South Park and not South Park. I knew somebody in high school who said it the second way. We were not friends. Stress can sometimes be defined by the lengths of sounds, shorts and longs. That's how it's done in Romance languages and in traditional Arabic and other languages from around the world. But in English, it's a little bit more complicated because things like pitch will affect stress, as well as relative loudness of syllables and the timbre of your voice. If you look at the audio of me saying South Park in multiple ways, you can see that the first syllable is a little bit louder than the second if I'm stressing it. South Park, South Park. So maybe we take a look at the audio of James Brown singing I Feel Good to see which syllable is the loudest. I feel good. Well, they all look the same, so that's not very helpful here. One of the core features of stress patterns is we can subtly change meaning depending on which word is stressed within a sentence. So if we stress the I and I feel good, it's answering the question, who here is feeling good? I feel good. Stress feel, and it can seem like you're doubting whether or not you're good. I feel good. Alternatively, stressing feel can be a rejoinder to the compliment, you look good. I feel good. Stress good, and it can be the answer to the question, how do you feel? I feel good. The context here gives meaning and can influence our perception of stress within the words themselves. With that in mind, let's listen to James Brown saying, I feel good one more time. I feel good. Hmm. Okay, so probably the stress here is coming either on feel or good, or maybe it's both of them, but it's still kind of hard to say. I don't know. Part of the confusion that I have is that this is not spoken language. This is music. And when we talk about musical stress, things get a lot more complicated and they can conflict with ideas of linguistic stress. So when we talk about musical stress, I guess more technically speaking, it's metric stress. What we're doing is we're relating a rhythm to its underlying pulse. When we do that, we alternate strong, weak, strong, weak. So in a measure of four, four, the first beat is strong. The second beat is weak. The third beat is strong, maybe not as strong as the first, and the fourth beat is also weak. We can take each of those beats and break them down into subdivisions too, each of which gets a strong or a weak. So the first eighth note is strong, the downbeat, and the second eighth note is weak, the upbeat. Now what about groups of three, you might ask? Well, in a measure of three, four, traditionally the first beat is strong and the second two beats are weak. Now, when we say strong and weak, what we're really doing is we're talking about the relationship of the music to our own internal pulse, which is, which is very interesting. Check out this little melody, for example. Nothing's gonna change in the audio, like what changed when we listened to the difference between South Park and South Park. Instead, the stress pattern is going to change depending on your perception of where the beat lies. In other words, the relationship of the melody to the underlying rhythm. kind of wild, right? The music takes place in your head, not in the audio. So you really feel the rhythm differently as it relates to the pulse. And the way that we quantify this and understand this is in the system of strong and weak. Leonard B. Meyer talked a lot about this in the rhythmic structure of music, which was followed up by a generative theory of tonal music by Fred Lairdell and Ray Jackendov, who both end up using this linguistic notation to show strong and weak. Anyway, with this stuff in mind, we can take a look at the official published sheet music of I Got You and try and figure out what words are strong and what words are weak as they relate to the underlying pulse. I, in this case, lands on beat three. It is a strong beat. Feel lands on the end of three, which is weak, and good lands on the end of four, which is weak, which gives us the pattern strong, weak, weak. 
I feel good. I feel good. Hmm, that doesn't, that doesn't really sound like what's going on. I mean, I guess I can hear that first note as being accented. Daka, duh. But in this case, I just feel like the words feel and good have more weight to them. And I think this is an example of where the musical stress and the linguistic stress don't necessarily line up. Sometimes when that happens, you get examples of profoundly bad songwriting. Like for example, in the United States National Anthem on the phrase, the bombs bursting in air. Weak strong, strong weak, weak strong would be the normative reading of that in English. However, that's not what we get in the song itself. The bombs bursting in air. Oh my God, that is terrible songwriting. It sounds so bad. It's so unmusical. Gah, I hate it. I hate it so much. This is not what's going on with I Feel Good at all. Unlike the Star Spangled Banner, I Feel Good feels good. And part of the reason why that might be is because it's a syncopated melody, a melody which emphasizes the weak parts of the beat without including the corresponding strong ones. My goodness. Syncopation, Syncopation is extremely important in funk music and in jazz music and in rock music and any music of the Afro diaspora from the past 100 years. It's pretty damn fundamental in how this music is constructed and it subverts traditional understanding of how weak and strong work within melodies. So to show you what I mean, let's take that melody that we had beforehand and syncopate it by moving all of those notes to the off beats. So it has this kind of rhythmic drive to it, which I think is pretty cool. But I guess the problem here is that if we try and analyze it the way that we did before in terms of strong and weak, everything is weak, which doesn't really feel right. Like it doesn't really match my experience of the rhythm. Like there's still definitely ebbs and flows to the rhythm that aren't reflected in this kind of metric stress analysis. In other words, if you're emphasizing the weak beats, are they really weak anymore? Maybe. A great example of this is actually in the theme music to South Park. Les Claypool of Primus sings South on a 16th note syncopation. Going down to South Park, gonna have myself a time. It's on the uh of two, the last 16th note of the second beat, which in theory is the weakest position in the entire rhythmic scheme, but we're not really feeling it that way, or at least I'm not. In other words, the feeling that I'm getting from this is not South Park, it's South Park. David Temperley suggests a method of analyzing stress patterns in syncopation by first desyncopating the melody, whatever it might be, by moving the notes over in time by one eighth note or sixteenth note or whatever the subdivision is, so that you can better understand the underlying stress pattern of the melody itself. So if we follow this method and de-anticipate the lyrics so that feel lands on beat four and good lands on beat one, we now have the pattern, I feel good, strong, weak, strong. It also feels profoundly unmusical. Like maybe that is the underlying pattern, but that doesn't really reflect how I feel about the sound of James Brown singing. I, it doesn't sound like I feel good. It's like, ugh. I feel good. Syncopation really shows the limitations of a traditional strong, weak understanding of rhythmic structures in music. And it's also a fairly Eurocentric one because different cultures might emphasize different parts of the beat and think of them as strong and others as weak. For example, in classical Thai music, the accented beat, the emphasized beat is beat four, what we have been calling one of the weak beats. But again, it's a really weak if it's being emphasized every time as an important part of arrival. These feelings of strongness and weakness can vary quite wildly from person to person, from music to music, and from culture to culture. Because musical meter cannot easily be acoustically measured, musical stress occurs at the cognitive and sensory levels, and so is subject to any and all personal biases, whether they are biological or cultural. In other words, it's just all in your head. So anyway, we still don't have a good answer, and it gets more complicated because the second time that James Brown sings I Feel Good, he extends feel for a longer time so that good resolves after the downbeat. It, it resolves on the end of one. I feel good. So even though the beginning of feel lands on an offbeat, because he emphasizes it so much, it's hard to not hear feel in this context as somehow being accented. Like the pattern would be weak, strong, weak. I feel good. This is made more complicated because later on in the song, he adds an and in there. Wow, I feel good. 
and I feel good. It now sounds like the word I has a special emphasis because he now has an and before that. To make things even more complicated, the sheet music that we've been working with is not correct, or at least it omits information from the recording. It's assumed that there's only been one note per word, but I definitely don't hear it that way. James Brown sounds like he's singing melismatically where there are multiple syllables per word. <laughs> It seems like we need to split up an individual syllable into two components, a strong component and a weak component. But that second part of the syllable occurs on the downbeat. So is it, I feel good? <laughs> uh, this is getting too much. Okay, so I think it bears taking a step back here. Like, why are we doing this? What is the point here? Why are we spending so much time analyzing three words out of the beginning of James Brown's I Got You? And I think the answer here is that understanding accents is a fundamental part of musicianship, especially if you're playing melodies. If you're trying to phrase a melody just right, it's important that you understand what notes should be emphasized and why. The relationship to the underlying pulse, the strong beats and the weak beats can help you understand how to better shape a melody, especially when there are lyrics involved and the relationship of linguistic stress to that underlying melody's rhythm. It's a feel thing at the end of the day, and James Brown singing I Got You has a certain feel that's hard to define, and I think that's part of the reason why it feels so irresistible. It resists definition. But part of the journey of listening to music and playing music is at least making the attempt to understand, because even if you don't have the words for it, at least you can try and better understand your own feelings. I think the best answer here, honestly, is that all the beats are strong, because James Brown has no room for weakness. <laughs> I is strong, because it occurs at a strong point in the measure. Feel is strong, because it lasts the longest, and it also is the highest in pitch. And good is accented, because arguably it is the resolution of the phrase, and texturally makes the most sense. How does James Brown feel? I feel good. Thanks, James. And also thank you to Nebula for making this video possible. Today we talked about copyrighted music on YouTube, which means this video will definitely get demonetized and runs the very real risk of getting blocked by one of the major music labels. YouTube has proven time and time again that they will always take the side of major music labels over music educators and people doing music analysis here on YouTube. And so there is a very real existential threat to this community and the things that I do here making music education videos. It could all go away in a second, honestly, and that's something I'm very fearful of. So as insurance for myself and for this community, I've uploaded all of my videos to Nebula, a creator-owned streaming service that also features many other music educators here on YouTube, like Charles Cornell, Mary Spender, Listening In, 12 Tone, Sounds Good, Amy Nolte, and many others from other educational niches across YouTube. It's a great place to watch and discover quality content ad-free. I upload bonus videos, bonus content to there all the time. It is a creator-owned streaming service, which is important to me because it will never unfairly prioritize music labels over creators. Nebula in this video is supported by another fantastic streaming service, Curiosity Stream, the go-to source on the internet for the very best documentaries with thousands of titles to choose from, including Genius Within the Inner Life of Glenn Gould, a documentary all about the idiosyncratic practices of the great pianist. I, I really love Glenn Gould's music. It's a great documentary. I believe that the only excuse we have for being musicians and for making music in any fashion is to make it differently, to perform it differently, to establish the music's difference vis-a-vis -vis our own difference. If you're interested in great documentaries like this one on Curiosity Stream, you can click the link in the description or go to curiositystream.com slash Adam Neely and get a bonus subscription to Nebula for free. You can get this Curiosity Stream Nebula bundle for a limited time, 26% off or $14.79 per year. If you sign up to Curiosity Stream with the link in the description, you're not only gonna be supporting this channel, but all of the creators over at Nebula as we create content that aims to engage the world in a more meaningful way. Thanks for listening, everybody.